Because mm -hmm. when she texted that person, it's probably So you really enjoyed reading, but it's hard for yes. you to read now with everything? How long has this been going on for? You said earlier that you've been feeling depressed for at least a month. Day. Month. There's yeah. no SATs in April. No, I was in June. The name oh my God, God. my shoes. Are you gonna get I'll it? I'll take it. I'll take it. Oh. So it was really um, rude of you to call. So I know that you can uh, always call back when you Could you make a promise that you're not going to hurt or kill yourself? What was there a moment where you really, really thought about um, doing it, killing myself? Um, yeah, there was there was a few moments I had um, I had planned um, my own suicide. Um, Hope. What is that? Is that a true question? She wants to, okay? <laughs> I feel like a model, like, for real. Never gonna be mad at me. Um, I had been thinking about suicide pretty much every second of every day from a very, very young age. Like, I can remember it in elementary school. What had stopped me from attempting suicide was, uh, it was thinking about my mom. Um, I couldn't imagine what the pain that she would have gone through if, uh, if she had to, you know, say goodbye to me forever. My main method of research is called psychological autopsy. We start with um, usually a teenager that has died by suicide, and we interview their parents, uh, their friends, and depending on the research project, sometimes we interview a school teacher, coach, others, siblings, and we try to piece back together what was going on. Typically, when we um, put all the puzzle pieces back together, there are five or six reasons why the person completed suicide. They had multiple risk factors. There are multiple contributing factors that we need to be aware of. It can be stress from work, stress from school, financial stressors, COVID-19, the state in which everyone is living in currently. We are all living in our crises brain. There's a lot of unknown factors that we just don't know what's going to happen. This puts on a lot of stress, not only as us um, parents, but can put on a lot of stress to young adults, to kids. Yeah. It's important that we have an open and honest conversation within our family. 
smartest deal uh, which the smart car. How smart is that? Those things are tiny. Can you even track them in traffic? What what were you like as a child? Um as a child, I was very outgoing. Um, my parents divorced when I was really young, uh, before I can remember. I do, yeah, I'm an amateur, and like a really bad amateur. <laughs> single, single mother. Well, my mom was busy working, uh, you know, two or three jobs a day. Uh, I was staying at my friend's house or, um, you know, a babysitter's. So right now I'm in anatomy and physiology. Uh, Bio 202. It's a little, so it all starts with the, or, the or, aorta. It's the largest um, artery in the body. Um, I always felt like I was in on this on my own. One of the most important things that is going to be in every single call that we do is to make sure that person feels like they're not alone. You're not alone like you think that you are. There are always going to be other people that you can talk to. A group is like half up, half not. And it was like, no one's gonna go out, right? no one's gonna go out. Teenagers nowadays, the largest of their struggles is that they can't find somebody that they feel comfortable talking to. How are you feeling right now? Sometimes they're afraid of people judging them. Sad. We don't offer that kind of like judgment that they're so afraid of. What's making you feel sad? What we work to do every day is save lives. Are you still okay with talking to your counselor on Monday? Peer models work. Peer models are really efficient. And you're feeling okay? You want to talk to someone who looks like you or represents you in some way. I think what a lot of people outside of us don't always know or realize is that our volunteers are no different than our callers. You can turn around the corner and so like, hey. I go to Corona Del Sol High School and we've had a suicide or some sort of death, some sort of um, grief in our student body almost every year for the past couple years. We've lost a lot of young people over the years, um, especially in, in my district at schools like Corona Del Sol High School and, and Tempe. So we lost in the East Valley Michael in May of 2017. And then we lost Kara and Tyler in the same week at the end of July. And then like a week later, we lost Rudy. I started keeping track. Like I, I made an Excel spreadsheet and I hate the fact that I even did that. And the next thing I know, my spreadsheet, you know, has gone from a handful of kids' names to over 50 names. Last year, we got over 28,000 calls and texts. You just, you want ways to like stop thinking about all this so you can sleep. A third of those from kids that are having thoughts of giving up. What we know through research is that um, the, the best way at looking at preventing um, a lot of at-risk activities, suicide, substance abuse, uh, dropouts, um, you know, any of those things, that the best way to prevent that is what's called protective factors. Protective factors are the things that in our life protect us from when things get too much, too big, the risk factors get overwhelming, a family and friends, having a community, a safe community, um, which can, for kids, be a school, connection to help and a sense of connection. So that's also why our faith communities can also be so important, but also our sports clubs and volunteering and finding a sense of purpose in life and feeling like you're connected to something bigger, um, but also a sense of hopefulness is so very important. And you get that through all those other things. We need to tell people who have had a suicide that their family's at risk, you know, um, that there's a genetic component. 
were able to gather DNA of suicide completers for the past 20 years and actually look for genes which might increase the risk of suicide. And we know both from family studies but also genetic studies that uh, the risk of suicide from genetics is 45 to 50 percent of the risk, so it's much higher than you would anticipate. If you have a strong family history of significant mood disorders and you're starting to get depressed, don't say, well, I'll wait and see how bad this gets. No, get help early. The earlier you get the help, the better. Let's try to prevent problems before they snowball and get much worse. My research was the first to establish a link between youth suicide and the poverty concentration where a youth lives. Anthony! He's really, really fat. Drugs, that boy loves it. So for example, children living in households that have high poverty are at higher risk for having a parent in jail, witnessing violence in the home, or even experiencing physical abuse. There are a lot of people out there hurting. Hurting from generational trauma. The hardest part about on the reservations, I think pretty much every single family that I talk to knows someone who has passed away or been hospitalized for significant periods of time from COVID. And so that adds a, a whole other layer to what people worry about, that is it going to be my family, is it going to be one of my relatives? And those are bad thoughts. In the Navajo way, those are very bad thoughts. How has your life changed since COVID-19 came into the picture? I have been hanging around the same three people at home and it's kind of driving me a little crazy. And I don't have to go to school, but at the same time, I don't get to see all the people from school. So that's kind of messing with my head. <laughs> okay, so since COVID-19 started, my life has changed because um, I don't get to graduate in person, and I don't get to see a lot of my friends. It's hard to believe that it's going to be over. I might not even get it, you know? It's hard as a rural community to, to shift to a totally digital uh, platform in just a couple of weeks, but they're trying to do things that, you know, are, are supporting while they can. But the days are blurry. Um, <laughs> It is the 49th of February, March. I have no idea. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Blur's day. Um, so, all right, Ryder, what's been going on in your world? I'm missing looking into the future and being optimistic about it. Just because things get postponed doesn't mean that they go away. There's still chapters to the story, even though they're not written the way we want right now. The phone rang, and I remember walking over and picking up the phone. And the roommate was on the other end, and he said, uh, Les, Les has shot himself, and I think he's dead. I started going to Moms Demand Action meetings because I was so bothered 
by the suicides and the homicides that were happening in our country. I couldn't believe laws weren't changing. I couldn't believe people weren't out in the streets raging about this gun violence. I love seeing you out here, and we come year after year after year, but we're getting there. It makes sense to focus on certain common sense regulations concerning guns, given how dangerous they are and what they're capable of. We don't lock our door to our cars to guarantee 100% our car will not be stolen, but it makes it a little bit harder. So this safe specifically, first off, it weighs an absolute ton, it takes me three people to move it, and it's also bolted down to the ground. If you're going to choose to have something like that in your life and in your house, you can't ignore the realities of what it is. Before my daughter, I was very comfortable putting a handgun in like a, a bedside dresser, just putting it in, that's fine, no big deal. As it was like, okay, well, baby's coming, now I need to rethink. When we would go to somebody's house, a family that maybe we hadn't had a play date before, never been to their house, I would literally say, do you have any handguns or other weapons in the house? Is it locked up? Is it you know accessible to the kids? These are the things we really ought to be encouraging families, particularly that have guns, to be looking for. An individual who might take a fistful of pills and then moments later decide all right, this is a bad idea and calls 911, right? That opportunity doesn't exist with someone who uses a gun. I think it really raises the question, are we doing enough to understand and address this problem? And the answer is probably no. Of course I think it could have been prevented. Of course I do. They initially just wanted to talk about uh, medication. They didn't try to get to a source of the problem. First antidepressant I was on was Prozac. Um, and that was years ago, but I'll never forget that drug because it had given me just the worst day-to-day -day feeling. When medicines like Selexa and Prozac came out, even doctors didn't understand how important it was that they had a different side effect profile. These medicines have side effects, one that is very much of concern to us and is written about a lot is the possibility that people will get more suicidal. I stopped seeking help and it wasn't until about a year later after uh, stopping the medication that uh, I realized that uh, it was, it was an issue with or without the medication that I had to, I had to seek help for. And the traditional treatments do work. Um, unfortunately, there's a chunk of people that try multiple ones that it doesn't work for. From his position behind the reception desk in the health center, Joe has an opportunity to observe some of the little known aspects of student life. His newly aroused interest in his fellows has opened Joe's eyes to their problems. Jake was a very empathetic person. He struggled a lot too. Um, he had issues from the time he was about two. Uh, I knew something wasn't right when he would get so angry he would kick coals in the door at two. Look, 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 look. When he hit about 13, um, we started noticing that things were getting worse. We started to see some cuts on his arm. And then he started just saying some really disturbing things. All right, I'm cowboy. <laughs> I don't remember exactly how he said it, but basically he said, I am considering killing myself. 
and that's when we were like, okay, we need some more help. Um, and that's when we, we had hospitalized him. He was there five days. We visited every day, talked to the doctors. And after the fifth day, the insurance company was telling the hospital that they were, they were done paying for his care at the hospital. Time for him to go. This is like a, a five week time frame that he was hospitalized and the second time you let him go. And the insurance company told us it's not medically necessary for him to be in the hospital. There are longer term care facilities out there, but for a six month stay with them, it was gonna be, I think about $170,000. And, you know, even if we sold our house, we wouldn't have that kind of money to, to keep him there. I'm a mom. I should have been able to protect him and that I will carry with me for the rest of my life. And the fact that an insurance company can deny someone care astounds me. And it, it just, they have too much control. They have too much power. We're in a competitive market. People can shop for the best coverage. And if you're not delivering quality coverage, people are going to look elsewhere. So I think that provides a lot of protection. And it's also important to note that we are probably the most regulated industry. We knew Jake had been denied care. We knew that that couldn't be right on a human level. It's just not right. So, you know, Denise is like, well, what do we do? And I said, well, you know what? Why don't you write our legislators? I was hoping to meet with Representative Nutt regarding Jake. We attended a couple of those meetings and started talking about Jake and what happened to us and, and the insurance and all that. And the lady at the end of the table kind of leans forward and says, well, you know, there's a federal parity law. And we didn't even know what parity was at the time. Just as we would, would expect health insurance plans to cover the rest of our body, cancer, diabetes, uh, everything else, we shouldn't expect any lease for mental illnesses. If my son had had a cardiac condition, no way they would have released him before he was ready to go. We need to bring a state parity law to Arizona because we have a federal law, but it's really up to the states to enforce it and make sure the insurance companies are, are doing it. It's a fairly significant challenge to basically take benefits and look at them and make sure that a benefit for a heart surgery is treated in a similar manner to a uh, mental health benefit. So it, it's complex because many times you're talking about treatments that are very different. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, for the record, I am Denise Denslow. This is my husband, Ben. I'm still haunted by the heartbreaking memory, sorry, of Jake after one of his bipolar episodes. And he devastatingly looked at me and said, Mom, I'm a monster. And I was like, honey, nothing could be further from the truth. We just need to get you some help. Thank you for what you've done here this afternoon, what you've done in other committee meetings, and, and don't give up. I actually shut my phone off for like 20 minutes and meditated for a bit because I was getting so overwhelmed. So if the bill isn't passed today, what is the next step? Do this all again next year. Yep, we start, start all We start over. all over again. Yeah, we have thought about it and we're like, no, we're Oh, I'm so grateful for you. Members, you've heard the third reading of Senate Bill 1523. Those in favor, vote aye. Those opposed, vote nay. Do not vote until you hear the bell. The House will now proceed to vote. I think we got it. 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 Denise and Ben Denslow, Jake's parents, really are the heroes here. I'm going to be so bold as to break protocol and even ask for a round of applause for them.
when you lose a child, you lose a piece of your soul that you're never going to get back. And it's just that simple. His legacy is not how he died. It's in how he lived and how he helped people. And that's what we want to continue to focus on is the legacy of helping others. In honor of everyone Arizona has lost to suicide, this bill is for you. I know I'll see him again. I'm sure I'll hug him very hard. SB 1523, Jake's Law is the law of the land. I know this isn't his fault, so I think it'll just be hugging and, and saying you shouldn't have left so soon and, you know, and uh, probably never let go. <laughs> so really, no. yeah, but now I know I'll see him again.